It's a great pleasure to be here, um, and uh, it's actually, um, some of you use the word humble, it's very, it's, it really is a great privilege to, talk, to hear people talk who have actually dealt with um, uh, while on the ground, um, and I need to state at the very start, um, not only that um, I get the drug company money, but I've never actually seen a patient with Ebola, and I think it's important that um, uh, you say that, because a lot of this I'm a virologist, I've been doing virology for a lot of, a lot of years. Um, but uh, I think as an infectious disease physician, the, the key thing is to actually see people and see what goes on. So um, uh, Karl Popper is my favourite scientific philosopher, and I think this is a very, very important statement um, for many reasons. And um, it particularly applies in this case that uh, what we are dealing with um, is something that we know a certain amount about, but a lot of what I will talk about today, uh, a lot of the questions I think we have, uh, because not, a lot, not as much work has been done on the Ebola virus as has been done on a lot of other viruses. Um, and I like, and this is a slide, this is a, um, one from the internet, but this just looks at um, the way that you might arrange a, um, an urgent um, Ebola treatment centre with low probability, high probability uh, of all the um, I think that uh, diagnosis is um, often boring, quality assurance is even more dull. Uh, but I'm going to talk about both of them because I think they're both very important. Because what's lacking from that, of course, is diagnosis. And in this situation that Australia finds itself in, and these are the guidelines that you've seen earlier in New South Wales, um, the situation we're in is, of course, low prevalence, um, you know, likely events as we saw with SARS, uh, as we saw with, as we still see with MERS. Anybody remember MERS? Um, and as we saw with H5N1, as we saw with H7, uh, and um, as with H1N1 and epic influenza, that um, you can go very rapidly from a situation of seeing none to seeing a couple of unlikely to seeing uh, uh, a significant number of cases. So I saw, I talked with um, Ryan about. Uh, what I might talk about, and I thought I'd talk a little bit about basic virology um, and talk a fair bit about testing because that's one of the keys in a low prevalence you know, situation, a low incidence situation, <coughs> and then talk a little bit about treatments which um, are even less well established than some of the diagnostic things I'm going to talk about um, and uh, hopefully have some discussion in the time. So, um, Ebola is a classic virus in that it, it demonstrates acute infection and basically it wants to deliver its RNA payload to um, infect a cell and what it particularly infects are uh, endothelial cells, so cells lining blood vessels, uh, but importantly also infects um, some of the um, uh, immune cells and I talked a little bit about how it evades immune response and that's in some ways the way it causes most of the problem because of its effect on um, host immunity. Um, this is you, really just looking at the relationship between different types of Ebola and um, uh, Reston, which was a virus that infected primates in the US and transmitted between primates without direct contact between them. So um, there was a question in a paper from 1995, I think, about whether that might have been respiratory transmission. Um, but it doesn't infect humans. Um, but the current strain is, um, you know, uh, from earlier, I think, uh, is Zaire Guinea which is very similar to the um, original 1976 strain of um, uh, Ebola Zaire. And um, uh, the point is that these viruses mutate. Um, they're RNA viruses. They have a short, a relatively short genome, 19 kilobases. But they're a very big virus. You can actually see them under the microscope, which is the only virus that you can. Um, and um, it's because they're very long, and uh, they do mutate fairly um, easily. Um, they, Ebola viruses demonstrate a very classic acute sort of infection. So um, they don't tend to persist, they tend to come and go, uh, unlike something like HIV AIDS or um, um, herpes viruses, they don't persist in the individual host and they're horizontally transmitted, they're not transmitted from mother to baby typically. And you heard earlier, about, uh, uh, I think, from Michelle about the uh, fact that uh, pregnant women have such a, a poor outcome. Um, they, as I mentioned, mutate. Uh, they typically replicate in more than one species and, they can, uh, and have caused major uh, population deaths in gorillas and chimpanzees. And um, uh, they 
don't tend to evolve to persistence, which is kind of good news, really. Um, and they're very dependent upon the host population structure. So uh, that there's a sort of interaction, if you like, between virology and epidemiology that um, uh, these infections tend to spread from um, in zoo zoonotic matter when, it, when humans come in direct contact with infected primates and you, you're the term to push meat. Um, I'm not going to talk much about pathogenesis, but just to give you an idea of why this is such a um, horrendous clinical illness, uh, it's probably uh, because this is a, a sort of classic um, acute infection structure. Um, and the virus really infects humans as a, a, an accidental intermediate. It's not, a, it's not a good strategy for any organism to infect a room full of people and then not spread to another room full of people. It's not, if you, if you look at it from sort of end results teleologically, if you think about it, if, if we all very rapidly die and we don't spread it vertically, um, mother to child, or sexually, um, then really that's that's not a long-term strategy because that virus is going to really die out. And that's exactly what happens, and um, epidemiologically that's reflected in the fact that you get one or two hundred cases a year, uh, except for this outbreak, and they occur fairly rapidly. If you look, uh, sorry, fairly regularly. If you look, they will typically occur every year in different populations. Then then go. <coughs> um, the way that Ebola causes such horrendous uh, clinical disease is probably because of its immune evasion. <coughs> it, um, it's able basically to um, mask some of its, its immune presentation, so it sort of hides, if you like, um, and it, it can throw out chaff. It, it has uh, it throws out these glycoproteins that get seen by the immune system, but they don't contain a, a replicating virus. They're just sort of uh, to, to fool the immune system. And it also has a, a very strong effect on innate immunity. So the first immune response that you get when you get a virus. And so because of that, it can spread. And um, uh, through that spread, it, it infects endothelial cells, it infects dendritic cells, which are immune cells. Endothelial cells line with blood vessels, and that's why you get the enormous um, uh, bleeding complications that occur with Ebola. Well, it's one of the reasons. And it's a classic example of an emerging disease, and, and people you know far more about this than I, but uh, essentially it's basically expanded um, into a different population. And it's a classic example of change of an ecosystem. So in the uh, human primates coming in um, contact with non-human primates, either through urbanisation uh, or because of um, uh, eating bushmeat or, or contact with uh, dying or um, ill animals. And um, uh, the important, important feature of emerging viruses is in this setting is, the, is what the fourth point here, that there is a constantly evolving relationship. And um, as many of you are aware, uh, this situation with Ebola has been predicted for a number of years, not only by people who were sort of in the press, but uh, people epidemiologically, as well as virologists, as well as people <coughs> on the ground that there is a risk of this once um, the coronavirus enters a, um, an urban population. And um, uh, I'm not going to talk much about um, epidemiology because it's frightening in front of an audience like this, but the red bit is Ebola. And uh, the point is that typically we, we associate Ebola with, with populations in central um, Africa. Um, and uh, really the spread to the West Africa has been unusual. However, think other viral hemorrhagic fevers like Lassen fever um, have been associated with West Africa. So the population structure has, has allowed some viral hemorrhagic fevers and Ebola's kind of the next one. So, uh, and that's what we've seen, and you've seen this uh, slide before, I think, um, that it's predominantly been in a couple of countries. And uh, uh, it's fascinating that Senegal and Nigeria, which was the country, particularly Nigeria, which is a large population centre, a largely urbanised country, where um, there was so much concern being able to control infection certainly for the last couple of months, which is great. Um, incubation, uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about the clinical features except to put it in uh, context, uh, can be very quick and this is probably related to the amount of virus that you receive. You can receive a lot of virus in a very um, uh, concentrated way. So if you, uh, uh, for example, the, the guy in America who died from Liberia uh, was said to have resuscitated a relative who was pregnant with Ebola in the back of a taxi. Um, there was clearly a lot of contact, not surprisingly, very short incubation, a lot of virus, overwhelming infection, very rapid progression to um, bleeding and death, and no response to antiviral treatment. 
whereas the longer incubations are probably associated with a smaller amount of virus, different um, a healthy individual, and um, uh, slower, uh, slower progression, and probably better response to um, therapy. Um, the only comment I'll make about clinical features, because you've had this, is that they're obviously very early on uh, are very typical symptoms of, of a whole range of illness, so they're very non-specific. Um, and you know, somebody with pharyngitis and contractile infection who presents at Sydney Children's Hospital, in my view, has adenovirus or an enterovirus. Um, so these are very. Um, there's a lot of infections that cause these things, and it's really the multi-organ failure to develop rapidly shock that's um, so distinctive. So what I was going to focus on um, was uh, um, testing because I think that's what I actually know something about, and. Um, I actually think it's extremely important. Uh, we, um, uh, I oversee a um, security sensitive bio biological organism, uh, biological agents um, quality assurance program. And um, uh, I think we got that grant uh, six, uh, five years ago and then it was refunded because we said any diagnosis of a security sensitive biological organism will have major you know, community, public health and political issues. And uh, it's quite true because if we get it wrong, um, and uh, this applies to all the organisms, but clearly we're talking about Ebola. If it's wrong, then there's major ramifications. I mean, government looks silly, I would be foolish if it's made a wrong diagnosis. Um, but more importantly, we've precipitated a whole lot of public health waste and we've caused a whole lot of individual concern that we don't need to. So it's actually very important to get the diagnosis right in a population such as this, where rates are, are much lower. Clearly, in a population which is at higher risk, the diagnosis actually becomes simpler because the likely diagnosis is more likely to be correct than it's positive. And so issues like um, diagnosis, uh, you feed into the issues of how do you collect, transport and store specimens, um, how do you inactivate material, um, how do you process the specimens, uh, how do you distinguish between the child with adenovirus and the child with um, uh, Ebola and, and um, that's really done on epidemiological grounds rather than biological and clinical grounds. And um, I'll talk a little bit about point of care because I think that's going to be a, uh, an emerging issue that will be very important um, going forward. Uh, there are, is a contingency plan. Um, when I was a registrar, I worked on this, um, and at that time we thought it was uh, a long way in the future. Um, and I wasn't a registrar for that long. Um, so, who to test is very important. and. Uh, again, this is um, I think this is something that's been discussed, but um, uh, the key is the epidemiologist, really not the uh, clinical ID or the virology, because um, uh, it's epidemiologic exposure. Um, you've, these are the, um, the the list of high possibility versus low possibility. The point is that um, in thinking about diagnostics, in thinking about how we handle specimens. Um, the reality on the ground here is that uh, the majority of um, adults or children with a fever and a sore throat will not have Ebola and therefore uh, there has to be some stratification or else we will be testing daily literally hundreds of specimens, if not more, across the state which have to be um, wrapped up. It takes about, uh, about an hour or so to wrap up a specimen that has a, um, a potential SSBA in it. So we have to place stratify the low and high possibility, not only for the patient's sake, but from the point of view of um, uh, ha practical, pragmatic things on the ground. Um, <coughs> we use as much pre-packaged and um, uh, pre-organised um, things as possible. We use as much disposable material as possible. Um, Ebola is a virus that's easily um, uh, killed, really. Uh, you can hit it for... 56, 57 degrees for about 30 to 60 minutes, and um, it'll die very, very quickly. Um, but the concern, of course, is that um, our blood and other specimens are highly infectious, and the reason for that is that they contain a lot of virus. The sorts of packaging and, and uh, what we use in this setting, uh, and this is an example, uh, you have a tube where you collect blood. Um, this shows a vacuum tube. In theory, we're not supposed to use vacuum tubes. Uh, and by that we mean, I don't know if you had blood, but they put a needle in, that has a little needle at the other end, you stick the tube into that, the tube has a vacuum, it sucks blood in, you don't put a syringe in and take a needle and put it in because you stick the needle into your hand. 
problem is vacuum tubes can also uh, create aerosols. And um, uh, the reality is we're probably going to do things that are pragmatic. Um, this tube goes into a, um, a blue plastic tube. That goes into another concealed container. And that then is, um, if it's a high possibility, that then is, is labelled as high possibility, uh, potentially Ebola, and sent um, for testing, definitive testing. In this state, it's done with ICPMR. Um, if it's a low possibility, uh, so that's called category A, for those who know, uh, that basically means you treat it as highly infectious. If it's a low possibility, we treat it as category B. It doesn't get labelled as Ebola at the moment. And um, uh, it's packaged in a similar way, uh, but it's treated in a slightly different manner in that um, we regard it as low possibility. We still take a lot of precautions in the laboratory, um, and um, we are currently discussing whether laboratory workers who are treating or handling low possibility of specimens, that is, we don't think it's likely to be Ebola, should wear um, uh, fluid repellent masks and full face shields and goggles. Um, it's likely that that will happen and that in our laboratory, up here at, um, at South Eastern Area Laboratory Services, where, where I work, um, it's likely that will be handled in the PC2 slash PC3 laboratory, so negative pressure in a, in a hood, um, and that our um, laboratory scientists would double glove and wear their face shields. Um, and that's kind of belts and braces. Uh, you've heard about, you've heard more than um, I know about um, uh, um, decontamination and um, prevention. Basically the virus responds um, and is easily killed by sodium hypochlorite by a number of um, uh, disinfectants. And this is just a bit about sample and activation. Because obviously the other thing is if you took blood and you would activate the um, uh, virus within the sample and you could still test it, um, that means that you've really eliminated uh, a significant risk. Uh, in fact, if you heat blood um, to 57, 60 degrees for uh, 30 to 60 minutes, and 60 minutes is really kind of um, <coughs> you can do it for less than that, but that really means that you're sure that you've killed virus, then you can still do most tests that you need. And this setting is for the um, individual who presents to a casualty, has a fever, has, um, uh, for example, diarrhoea and vomiting, as the current outbreak seems to present with, rather than bleeding at the start, and um, who has been to West Africa and had appropriate um, uh, exposure, but has then progressed to bleeding and is presenting in extremis. So he's effectively coming in casualty um, with query Ebola and he's um, dying before your eyes and you need to resuscitate and you can't be tra transferred to uh, the VHF unit. And so um, uh, all the casualties and the infectious disease physicians and laboratory um, microbiologists, as well as biochemists, hematologists who deal with this situation, because if you're bleeding a lot, you need coagulation, you need to know how much you to resuscitate with. Um, all those things need to be tested, and they may need to be tested at peripheral sites. So they may be, need to be tested in emergencies at Wollongong or Prince of Wales, Dubbo. Um, and so we're now developing protocols, and I say developing, there are protocols that exist, but it's really standardising those across the state. Um, I mentioned category B, category A. Um, these have been in place for a long time. They're very standard classifications. Category A is um, somebody has a high possibility, and category B is basically everybody else. New South Wales has a specific courier. Uh, there's a relationship with that courier that's been developed. People have been educated, people have been, it's been discussed, and um, clearly, for low risk, the question is whether you transfer a patient or you transfer a specimen. At the moment, we're transferring specimens uh, in order to allow uh, any VHF facility not to be overwhelmed with low possibility of patients. Most bio biochemistry, most haematology, uh, never sees uh, a doctor. So it's a blood, it's put onto a line of other bloods, it goes through a machine and, and a result comes out. And all of the cap piercing, all of the handling of that specimen is done within the machine. Um, the, there's no handling physically of a, of a tube. Um, and hopefully there's no generation of aerosols. And, and this is where the issue with vacuums comes up. Um, most of these machines have very good decontamination protocols, but most of them have not been perfectly tried with things like Ebola because you don't. It's not the sort of study you do. They've been tried with other uh, surrogate RNA viruses uh, to look at whether they can be de decontaminated successfully. The actual test for Ebola is very simple. Um, I'm a molecular biologist, um, my 
PhD in my interest. And um, uh, to do a nucleic acid test for Ebola is the simplest thing in the world. You just need a set of primers and uh, appropriate design, appropriate quality assurance, which we now have, and you can do the test. So the actual definition is quite straightforward. Um, problems arise, uh, you know, uh, but the reality is that, that the issues are really around um, infection prevention and um, infection control rather than the test itself. There's a lot of interest in whether we can do point of care testing, and there's point of care assays for HIV, hepatitis C, influenza, RSV. Um, so there is likely to be a point of care for Ebola quite quickly. Um, there are certainly um, sort of beta test uh, kits available now. But there's also point of care for resuscitation. Um, but these machines are quite expensive. Um, but the benefit of them is you can take them down to emergency, you can handle a, um, an infected individual within a controlled setting um, that is negative pressure and where people are attuned to the infection risks. Um, and you take away a lot of those issues related to sample and um, transport. Um, and they will certainly work for the most important things we do in resuscitation. Um, there are guidelines, which I won't go into for, for reasons of time, but the US has guidelines, and um, you're going to see a lot of changes in these. I mean, these change uh, now uh, over the last couple of weeks on an almost daily basis in some way, and they're becoming more detailed about what the recommendations are, which is a good thing. Um, the UK, the US have guidelines, the Canadians have guidelines, and they're around very much the same things, decontamination, risk of specimens, um, use of automated analyzers, um, aerosol generation. The facilities you need for testing for a uh, biosafety uh, level four organism are quite stringent and expensive. And so um, the model for biohemorrhagic fever diagnosis in this country has been a centralised one, so there's typically one in most states, um, and uh, the uh, diagnostic service is based around protecting people when they're doing testing, but allowing um, a range of testing to be done on individual patients uh, to optimise their care. Um, the, the National Reference uh, Laboratory is in uh, Melbourne at Victoria Infectious Diseases Reference Laboratory, or Vidral, uh, and one of the key things is, is waste disposal. So um, not only um, waste from clothes uh, and you know, gowns, gloves, but also waste from things like um, testing, uh, air filtration, um, uh, water, and all those issues that require a lot of space. And physically, they're a very, um, they're a very challenging thing to put together. Just having a hood like this in a normal laboratory doesn't work because what do you do when you take things out? Works it might work for sort of an hour might give you an answer very quickly, but then what do you do in ongoing testing? And not only Ebola testing, but what do you do about testing for the individuals who's co-infected with malaria? What do you do about uh, the individuals having a heart attack? Uh, what do you do about the individuals pregnant? Um, I mean, clearly that's their sort of, their, their, their major issues, but um, you need a lot of other uh, testing available. And this is at the um, uh, BSL-4 facility at Bidrill in, in which is now located at the Doherty Institute um, about six months ago. And uh, the other thing is that you'll see in here there's an individual within the negative pressure, uh, within a uh, suit, a, a respirator, <coughs> a microphone, but there's also somebody watching them. So if they collapse, uh, either because they're too hot or because something's gone wrong, then the operator um, they can see that and that they're monitored regularly. So it's not cheap. Um, and the sorts of tests that we do, as I mentioned, are typically nucleic <coughs> acid tests or PCR that I bring out here as Nat. Um, you just, I don't know, who's, who's heard of PCR? Most of you, yeah. So it's, it's common technology now, and um, uh, it's really quite straightforward to diagnose whether Ebola is there or not using that. And we don't need things like culture and uh, electron microscopy, which are expensive, expose um, uh, the uh, operated to higher risks, uh, but we do need it in some kind of national facility, and that's uh, what's done in Bidrill. Uh, serology is done, and serology is very important in things like serous surveys of um, bats, uh, looking at um, background rates, because we uh, base our uh, mortality rate on cases, but of course that's probably uh, an overestimate. 
um, although it's uncertain and what you need are ser serological data to be able to say how many people get the infection but don't develop uh, disease or develop a disease that recovers. Um, clearly Ebola has a very high mortality rate and um, uh, you know, we heard that it may be closer to 70% or 50% but I think that um, a lot of those data really aren't available and um, uh, it's the case with a lot of emerging diseases that they don't become available for some time. This is just a, um, a, a diagram to sort of show that um, between uh, zero on your left and um, uh, you know, years on the right, early on you have a viremia, as you do. Um, viral nucleic acid, that is the virus, is detectable um, for several weeks, probably three or four. Um, and then you gradually get a, an IgM response. There may be some differences in the way uh, IgM responses occur with Ebola. But typically you get a, an IgG, which is your long-standing antibody that met their mass for years. Um, and just before I spoke, somebody asked, well, does that mean that you become immune? That is, re-challenge uh, doesn't result in reinfection. And my presumption has been um, uh, that that's the case, but um, I haven't seen it tested. And um, certainly within primate models, there's not all guinea pig models or mice where it's been uh, looked at. Um, or where Ebola has been used, uh, sorry, studied, um, it hasn't been looked at in great detail. This is one of the key parts, if nothing else today um, from my talk, um, I think it's important to remember that when you are infected with Ebola, you have a lot of virus in your blood and it persists for a number of um, days. And um, so typically looking at things like hepatitis C, HIV, we're talking about thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions. Um, this is 10 to the 9th to 10 to the 7th copies per mill of blood. That is a massive amount of virus. So for a virologist, that's just overwhelming infection uh, when I hear that. And um, if you look, this in, in the darker colour is uh, fatal cases. Uh, in the light, light um, colour is uh, non-fatal cases. If you die from the bowl, you seem to have more virus. Is it because you're more overwhelmed immunologically and therefore the, um, uh, you get more virus growing or is it because having more virus kills you? They're probably interrelated, but the point is that um, you get a lot of virus. It's hard, you know, you have a huge amount of virus in blood. Uh, that also is in saliva. That's one of the reasons it's so infectious. Quality assurance, um, uh, as I say, the second most boring subject in the world, um, is very important. And so we, when this came about, uh, as part of the Commonwealth funding, we wrote to the Commonwealth and said we thought we should be doing a quality assurance for Ebola because somebody's going to be asking us about it in the next 12 months, and this was about 12 months ago. So we did a module in um, uh, February, March of this year. We sent it out to the five laboratories who have some, some um, uh, ability to do it, and basically they got it all right. Um, two of them didn't send it back for the initial report, and we're just about to send it out again. That's very important because we, there's a whole lot of issues like where you get it from. You can't actually go out and buy a bottle, like you can buy a serum that has HIV or hepatitis C. We, we can't go down to casualty, we can't get, you know, you need ethics approvals, you need a whole lot of things. And so that took about three months. And so we use artificial constructs, so we, can, we get them uh, from the US. They wrote to me and said, are you going to use these for um, any um, uh, bioterrorism or biotech purposes? I signed and said no. And then they gave it to me. And um, these are basically non-infectious constructs. So and also, it's a much cheaper way of doing it. And um, we have constructs based upon uh, Zaire strain. Uh, which was fortuitous because it was Guinea, the Zaire Guinea is most likely the um, original Zaire strain. Point of care tests, I've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I think are very important, and we have them for HIV. Uh, most of you, are you all aware that HIV, you can now get point of care tests, you can buy them on the internet. The TGA license, unfortunately, will be available in a better way than just on the internet. We've had them for influenza for several years. They're not great, um, they miss probably about a third to a half, but they're good because they are typically, if they're positive, they're usually right. And you can do them at the bedside and they're about, at the moment, about 10 to $15 per test. So it's a useful way of getting a, a quick answer. A lot of issues, things like quality assurance, um, uh, whether they're actually right for the specimen you're using. You know, can you use them on saliva, can you use them on blood? Um, and currently they're limited, but that's all going to change and clearly there will be some for Ebola. And, 
there's very good evidence that if you use them in a setting where people are not used to using them, um, if you use them in a setting where people are not trained, even though they're simple, so the same as that there are uh, immunochromatographic tests like a pregnancy test, um, but if you use them in that setting and not in the laboratory, they don't work as well. So it's really about, about um, education and having people. People don't have to be scientists to use them. Um, they can be clinicians or even um, not have um, university training. They're simple to use, but you've got to use them over and over. So it's not you, no use in using them once a month uh, because you have a much higher rate of false positives and false negatives. They're available for malaria. They're reasonably good for malaria. And this has been part of a long-term malaria program. And um, in this setting, in this country, they, they're going to be used in uh, high possibility individuals um, at the bedside for malaria. Um, in the last minute or so, um, treatment. Uh, we do a bit of work on antivirals. We have, do no work at all on Ebola uh, antivirals. And um, uh, however, we have experience with using intravenous immunoglobulin in the outbreak of Enterovirus 71. Um, uh, about 10 years ago, there were several hundred <coughs> thousand cases of Enterovirus 71 infection in um, uh, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia. Uh, along with developing um, Nipah virus epidemics. Uh, are we all aware of that? There are about 6,000 uh, children who now have, um, because of polio-like syndrome, who now have respirator dependence or some effect in those countries. Um, and there's, uh, we had a much smaller outbreak here. There were the order of sort of 50 to 60 um, uh, two years ago. And 10 years ago, uh, there were about um, uh, 10 kids who wound up in Sydney Children's ICU and, and a similar number in children with Westmead, two of whom are now respirator dependent. Um, the point about that is that enterovirus 71 seemed to respond to intravenous in that goblin. So we took it from contacts. Um, and as another RNA virus, Ebola virus seems to have a similar um, response. Um, so there's a lot of interest in ZMAP, which is a monoclonal antibody, or really mimics that, but amplifies that effect. Um, antiviral drugs are very interesting. Um, the um, uh, antivirals that have been used, uh, uh, sodofovir, uh, there's a new form of it called um, uh, CMX001 or green sodofovir, which is a, an antiviral we use for double stranded DNA viruses like herpes viruses. This is a single stranded, negative strand RNA virus, so very different. So it's like chalk and cheese, but there does seem to be some response uh, in vitro to green sodofovir. Uh, Fabipravir, fab which has been used for influenza in Japan. Um, it appears to have some effect as well. That makes more sense because then there's another RNA virus. And there's a, um, uh, an RNA, RNA I, that is an RNA inhibitor called TKN Ebola, which has been used in primate studies and seems to have some um, effect. Um, I think that's about my time, so I'll finish very quickly. Just to say, most of the studies are animal studies. Passive immunization seems to work if you give it early enough, but if it's left too late, presumably because of viral uh, replication, um, the animals die. Um, I won't talk about vaccination. Um, I mentioned these three antivirals. We talked before this about lamivudine, which is an antiviral used for hepatitis B virus, which again is a double-stranded DNA or partially double-stranded DNA virus, unlike Ebola, which is RNA virus. That does seem to have some effect. And there's been some press um, uh, and internet press about um, the use of highly active antiretroviral therapy, uh, which also makes sense, but um, uh, really, it's all very um, anecdotal at the moment, um, and there's not a whole lot of uh, information. Um, sorry, there's a lot of information, there's a whole lot, not a whole lot of science. Um, uh, finally, I, I, I like to end on a positive note. Um, uh, Sierra Leone um, and um, neglected tropical disease has been a, a fantastic, um, uh, really success story. And um, in a small country, engaging with the community, uh, not locking them up, as I think happened in, in um, uh, what was it, Sierra? Sierra was, it? was it Sierra Leone? They, in, in their neglected tropical disease work, have been um, decentralising, very engaged, um, uh, engaged with mobile technology, so skipped over large infrastructure. And in things like, um, you know, malaria, um, trypsomiasis, they've been very successful. And so um, there is some positive um, kind of idea that, that it may work, and particularly Senegal and um, Nigeria, which I thought was going to be uh, an enormous problem. Uh, haven't had cases for, I think it's 45 and 47 days, respectively, so I've been declared Ebola free. Um, Mike Adams is going to talk about uh, emerging disease. We have a meeting, and if you look at the website, 
You're welcome. Alan, thank you very much.